Hello and welcome to The Scoop, our weekly Henry Jackson Society discussion on the threats facing the Western world, being broadcast to you live from Millbank Tower in the heart of Westminster. While others are keen to play down the threats facing our democracy values and societies, here we promise to give you the truth, straight and unvarnished. Just as importantly, we pledge to involve you, our audience, too. This show is not about us talking and you listening. Instead, if you've got something to say, you can click the link in the video description just under where you are watching. You'll be redirected to our online studio and might get to ask one live. I can't promise we'll agree with you if you're called, but I can tell you we'll certainly engage with your point of view. Today, we are sticking with the theme of the invasion of Ukraine that we started discussing last week. With Vladimir Putin making slow progress with his military assault and his forces resorting to increasingly desperate attacks against civilians in order to crush Ukraine's brave resistance, I'll be asking where the conflict heads next and whether we are doing enough in the West to roll back Russia's aggression. Joining me at HTS Towers to discuss this subject is Daily Telegraph columnist and former Chief of Staff at Number 10 Downing Street, Nick Timothy. And don't forget, we want to hear from you during the show with your thoughts. To ask your question live, please click through on the link in the description below or visit henryjacksonsociety.org, the scoop, and we will do our best to bring you into the discussion. Nick, a pleasure to have you here, Thanks although, so of course, at the gravest of times. OK, we've just come off the back of President Zelensky speaking in rather Churchillian tones, obviously, about what's happening. Do you think his plea for us to do more is going to be heeded in Westminster? Well, I think there's a certain capacity for the West to do more. Uh, there's, there's more that can still be done, done in terms of the economic pressure that can be applied uh, to Moscow. There's more that can be done, I think, in a diplomatic sense. Uh, and we can go on arming the Ukrainians and perhaps uh, give them uh, equipment and, uh, and, uh, and uh, aircraft and so on that uh, they may be lacking. Uh, where I think he is likely to be disappointed uh, is his request for the no-fly zone, I think is very difficult for uh, NATO countries to accept. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there, obviously, in terms of where we could go here. Um, what do you think, just for a second, the politics of this are domestically? Are British people, and for that matter, the publics and other Western countries, generally in favour, in your view, on the squeeze of Russia, even though it might, of course, be leading to you know, pain in their own pockets? Yeah, I think um, the opinion research that does exist, I think, shows uh, a slight difference across uh, the different countries, which uh, the different NATO countries, which I think, uh, in, to some extent, reflects the exposure of risk. So in this country mm -hmm. where we're less exposed to the danger of, uh, of disruption to energy supplies, for example, the, the public is, uh, is, is hard aligned. Uh, but what's interesting is the changes in public opinion in some of those countries where you've traditionally had a softer approach to Russia and the complete turnaround in German public opinion uh, has been has been pretty interesting. But this is, of course, before uh, the, the costs to each of us in, in Western countries starts to come home. So, I mean, do you think then when, when those costs essentially are are going to start being felt is that going to change the mood are we suddenly going to see if you like the breakdown of this general consensus right now that we've got to resist russia with everything we've got i think it depends a little bit on on events okay. uh, i think at the moment uh there's there's a real sense of revolt of resolve right around europe but i think um actually that resolve may stiffen further um in the coming weeks as the atrocities that we've already seen uh, start to mount, uh, and certainly as some of the um, assaults uh, are underway on some of the cities and civilian losses uh, increase, then I think public opinion is likely to harden. But obviously, in all of these circumstances, uh, the longer things go on, uh, the more the costs are borne by uh, by people in countries that aren't affected, then, then there is always the risk of fatigue. Yes, I mean, that, 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 that is quite clear, as we've seen in the past with various um, uh, other uh, foreign um, you know, kind of uh, incidents. Now, obviously, you've sat in Number 10 Downing Street. You've been a special advisor in government. How does government get moved by public opinion on some of these issues? And, and in a sense, how much tends to be led by, by the government itself? Now, you didn't face a big international crisis like this. I mean, you had you know, uh, Brexit to deal with matters like that. But where's that balance uh, when you're sitting in Number 10, for example, getting all this information in, how do you, you know, kind of interpret it? 
Uh, you, we use the word balance, and I think that is the right word, because I think sometimes you have people who say, well, you know, the government is manipulating public opinion, or uh, some people who say this government's really shallow, it's just chasing public opinion, and people actually say similar things about the media all the time as well. Mm. Uh, when in truth, actually, it's a, um, a, it's a, um, it is a balance, and the the two sides can reinforce one another. They can they can shift positions on the other side, uh, and so on. And I think uh, I mean I think this country is used to its governments taking uh, strong positions on foreign policy against uh, uh, military aggression from authoritarian states. Uh, uh, we are not shy about using our military in the way that some European countries are. Um, uh, but I think this this government has uh, has by and large done a pretty good job. It's been strong. It it saw the danger of a Russian invasion early. Um, it is good that European. But by the way, on that, do you think we had pretty good intelligence sources to give us that ability to see the uh, the invasion, if you like? Well, I think clearly we did because the British and American intelligence services were actually being incredibly open. Uh, about what they saw happening and what they uh, expected those things to lead to. Now, I know uh, inside government there was still some uncertainty quite close to the invasion about what Putin's actual intention was. Was he using it to create some leverage? Was he uh, going to launch a limited attack? Was it going to be a full-scale invasion? Um, uh, but the, but the, certainly the, the public lines, which would have been informed by the intelligence, um, <clears throat> uh, reflected the belief that uh, there was likely to be a full-on invasion. Now, that was helpful, I think, in terms of undermining Putin's own uh, uh, alleged cause for going into Ukraine. So it was a victory in that sense. But it also meant that from quite early on, uh, we were uh, working very hard to, to supply the Ukrainians with arms, arms that have, uh, that have proved to be... Uh, um, quite decisive, I think, in the in the early days of, of the fighting. So, in your assessment, Boris Johnson has had a good war or a bad war thus far? Uh, I think, in terms of the the military side of things, the diplomatic and intelligence side of things, a good war. Um, <clears throat> I think on some of the more domestic questions, such as uh, the um, how we handle the flows of refugees and what's Britain's role in that, um, and in terms of the sanctions against certain Russian individuals, uh, there's more of a case to, to answer. Well, the, well, let's look at those for a second then, as <coughs> you quite <coughs> rightly pointed some of, the, uh, some of our direct direction in that way. So let's look at the refugee question. Uh, is it a bit surprising to you the government has, has sort of stumbled a little bit in this area, and the Europeans were <coughs> quick out the mark and were quite generous with their approach, and we appear to be, you know, kind of building schemes as we go along, and it doesn't seem to be translating into what the public are after. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to say, it is actually quite legitimate for the government to say that it's important that we have processes in place so that we're uh, conducting checks and making sure we know who it is uh, who's coming into the country. And we don't just completely open the door. <coughs> However, uh, we've known this has been coming for a while. It was obviously going to produce uh, a refugee crisis, and and I think there are things um, <clears throat> that might have been done differently, and some principles that can be applied to most of these crises. So, uh, so learning from I think what was actually quite a successful approach uh, during the Syria crisis, uh, you can uh, automatically say any Ukrainians who are here on a particular kind of visa, student work visas, etc., those visas can be extended. So there's no mm -hmm worry about their future. There's no uh, need to claim for asylum early or anything like that. Uh, and then you should be thinking about how you create special programs <clears throat> to bring people over <clears throat> directly, the people who probably need the most help that, uh, that is maybe only available <clears throat> in a place like ours. Um, uh, and then there's the third element, which is trying to provide as much help as you possibly can <clears throat> in the places most affected, the, the neighboring countries. Uh, so supporting countries like Poland uh, with the big flows that they've been receiving. Well, I think, <coughs> as you say, you, you, you've got those, uh, you know, those kind of options uh, which have been put out in the past. Do you think the reason the government hasn't gone down that route is somewhat linked to the whole Brexit debate around 
if you like, migration and <clears throat> those sorts of issues, which have made it kind of wary of going there, uh, even though, as you've highlighted, this has been done in the past and people haven't objected. Um, well, I think it might be affected by the, the context in which we find ourselves, which is that uh, the government's been struggling with asylum as an issue for some time with the boats that cross the channel. <coughs> Excuse me, the way the... Um, Russians uh, the way the, yeah. I'm sorry. The Russians. Well, I certainly hope not. This was um, Henry Jackson's Society Procured Water. So, uh, <laughs> I'd be nervous about your affiliations if that were the case. Um, um, the the way in which uh, the asylum system has been abused through uh, through these gangs that are smuggling people over the channel. Um, and there is there is an important political point to be made here, which is. Um, if you want to maintain support and if you want to maximize the resources that are given to people fleeing terrible circumstances as they are right now in Ukraine, then you need to make sure the system is working uh, and you need to stop people from abusing the system. You need to stop people from using it as a means for economic migration in order to be able to help more of the worthy cases. Okay, so there's an interesting case of one, if you like, one issue morphing into another and, and causing... I suppose, disturbance in that way. Uh, just a reminder to you at home that, of course, uh, we are open to your questions as well, although I'm dominating the debate right now. Uh, you're very welcome to join it. Click on the link and you'll be put through and we'll hear from you in a moment, I hope, as well. Um, now, Nick, you also mentioned sanctions, of course, and we have been, interestingly, um, uh, you know, rhetorically, we've been quite sort of prominent on this uh, sort of um, side of the debate. But as, as we've seen, you know, other countries appear to have been able to move very quickly on sanctioning individuals in particular, the so-called oligarchs. Um, and it's been a, a lot more painful over here. Uh, any sense of why that is? What's your reasoning for why we've been so, uh, so painfully slow on that? <laughs> well, if you talk to insiders in government, mm. uh, and if you talk to some of the parliamentarians who are most uh, concerned about this, uh, the, the answer keeps coming back that basically our legal regime for sanctions is a mess. Uh, it's too difficult to, to do. There are too many uh, routes of appeal um, and that the sanctions regime will need to change. Um, and uh, and that being so, I mean, it seems to me that time is of the essence in a case like this. And, and we are, after all, in quite extraordinary circumstances. This is the invasion of a sovereign nation in Europe uh, by an aggressive regime. Uh, there is absolutely no cause for the war. It's a war of aggression. It's a war crime. And a lot of the people we're talking about who might face sanctions are people who um, are very close to the Kremlin, whose wealth is contingent on relations with Putin. Um, some of these people have only built up their wealth because of relations with the Russian state. Many of them have only preserved their wealth because of relations with the Russian state. So there is a, there is a case for acting against Russian individuals uh, not all Russian individuals, being Russian isn't a crime, but some of some named individuals. Um, and, and there's a case for doing it quickly. And I, the, the argument I've been trying to make over the last week or two is, is if the sanctions regime is as complicated and problematic as people say, there is a case for uh, a simple piece of legislation which the House of Commons mm. would be able to pass mm. in a day. In a day yeah. uh, <clears throat> that said, notwithstanding various uh, means of appeal that these oligarchs lawyers will undoubtedly try to exploit <clears throat> notwithstanding those things the parliament votes for named individuals and their families to be expelled from the country and to have their assets seized you would have to provide a certain amount of information about why they are individuals of concern yes <clears throat> you wouldn't be able to go into too much detail because some of it will relate to life intelligence um, but I think there would be a case for doing that. Uh, and, and you wouldn't do this in, in probably any other circumstances. But this is such an extreme situation. And some of these individuals are so obviously linked and the intelligence is so clear that there would be a strong case for doing something like that. I wouldn't disagree with you, of course, on that. Um, and I think, you know, that the sooner we did that, the better, particularly <laughs> as we are, in a sense, trailing because of the sanctions sort of um, backlog with, with some of the rest of the, uh, some of the, rest of the uh, continent in particular. Um, obviously, we're not going to get into, into, into names as such, <clears throat> but there is some fear that, you know, part of the reason the government's dragging its heels is because certain individuals have been 
you know, somewhat close to politicians who are in the government. Do you, do you, you know, what's your, again, you've sat in, in, in the centre of this sort of thing. What's your view on this relationship between donors and uh, leaders? Uh, well, I mean, I, I should say that my personal view is, um, given, um, given the controversy of, um, <clears throat> of the, uh, the actions of the Russian state, the methods of the Russian state, the way in which it is known that London is used as a as a as a laundry for for dirty money, um, and given the uh, you know the known methods of things like compromat, um, uh, bribery, blackmail, and so on, um, I've always actually thought that uh, it's unwise to take money from any Russian national, um, even if they're joint nationals. Um, uh, so just you know, just, just because it is, it if is, in doubt, leave it out. <clears throat> exactly, just because that is probably the safest thing to do. Um, but the Conservative Party has taken some money from um, uh, from some joint nationals. I have to say, in my experience in government, um, uh, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any moments where those people have sought to or successfully changed uh, government policy. Um, so, uh, so I, I can't believe that uh, some of the worst allegations or innuendo that are made about this are true. Um, but I do think that uh, it's probably naive to have done that. Um, and I think, uh, I think one of the benefits, I mean, going back to the point about the, the idea of um, a standalone piece of legislation, mm. one of the benefits of doing something like that, um, and for and for organisations who are taking quite um, strong positions, cl morally clear positions, is that, um, is that the change that that brings goes way beyond the specifics of what you're talking about. It signals a moment where we say enough is enough. And, uh, and this is a turning point in the way in which we handle Russian money and influence uh, in the UK. Uh, and I think that would be very welcome. Well, I think I think a lot of people are regarding this conflict as a turning point. I mean, I think obviously uh, people have been so shocked by by the the way this has sort of uh, unfurled onto our TV screens. Of course, the terrible uh, crimes that have been committed on Ukrainian soil. That I think there's a sense of um, things must change. And I wonder if one I'll put a theory to you. I wonder if one of the ways that things will change is that you know for the last few years we've been somewhat preoccupied, have we not, with you know issues that have been broadly term the woke agenda and this has sort of become number one you know kind of focal point uh, of the media in particular and certain institutions do you think something like this where you've suddenly had real world issues once again exploding onto the world stage reminds us of the reality that we've got to be focusing on the big issues not the trivial inner stuff and then actually we need to always be fighting for the cause of freedom you know domestically and externally because you can't take it for granted yeah, I do. And I think, I mean, <clears throat> uh, we say this as a turning point, so hopefully it is. <clears throat> you know, there's always the worry that uh, once something slips down the news agenda and, uh, and, and even wars do that, um, uh, or when this war is resolved in one way or another, um, that we won't continue to um, take the lessons from it into the future. Uh, and, and we really should. Um, and even now, I think when we talk about it, there's quite a lot of flippant language, which suggests that actually, I don't think people have caught up with uh, the danger of our times, where you know, when you're talking about oligarchs and their money, people might say, uh, you know, we believe in due process, don't we? And we believe in an open economy, don't we? And of course we do. Um, uh, but that shouldn't be used to, to deal with serious wrongdoing. Um, in our capital city, and and you have these kinds of conversations where people talk about things like, well, we can impose uh, a no-fly zone, can't we? Which is it's an argument. We, you, you know, it's something that should be discussed. But a lot of the time, when it is discussed, it's done in this kind of way that implies some kind of clinical, easy, risk-free uh, um, kind of activity, because we've fallen out of the habit uh, of being in a confrontation with big, powerful states, and in this case, a state with nuclear weapons. Um, and you know, there's nothing more serious than talking about 
uh, the sovereignty of a country that is under military attack and and a confrontation between us collectively, the West, and uh, a state like Russia, and it might at some point in the future be other states, uh, that are nuclear armed. Um, and, and I think we really need to, we need to, this, you know, this, if we are about to enter into a Cold War, this is going to be different to the last Cold War. Mm. Our economies are more integrated, technologies are different, world trade is very liberal. Uh, we don't just face a kind of nuclear standoff. <clears throat> we have these kind of like hybrid attack capabilities on the other side where they're trying to undermine our democracy and our media and so on. Cyber uh, potential. Cyber, yeah. you know, the, a lot of organized crime in this country actually originates in, originates in Russia. Um, there's all of these things, but there are also lessons from the last Cold War too. You know, we need uh, really determined political leadership. We need strong military capabilities. We need clarity. So... You know, he knows, Putin knows, uh, the lines that we are not prepared to let him cross without serious consequence. Um, uh, and we need, you know, we need moral seriousness and we need to behave as though our civilization, which I'm made a bias, but I think is the greatest civilization the world has known. Um, it's objective as well, but go on. Yes. Um, uh, is worth defending. Yes. And that we're not ashamed of who we are, we're not convinced that everything we did in the past was evil. Uh, that we don't uh, see every problem in the world and somehow claim it's our fault. Uh, those things obviously aren't true. Plenty of people seem to think they are. Um, uh, but they're a huge distraction. Uh, and we need our institutions, um, starting with our governments and our parliaments and our military and our um, diplomatic service and so on, to be strong, self-confident uh, and, and determined to play, ultimately, a winning role in another very serious, very dangerous standoff. Well, I think that's obviously, uh, yeah, obviously key, I think, in terms of uh, uh, thinking of the future and where we should um, you know, kind of go on in that way as well. Um, we're going to go to questions in a moment from, from our audience. One question, just to follow up on that, um, the green agenda. This, of course, has been massive in recent years. And suddenly we're discovering energy dependency, of course, less so in the UK than other places. But we're looking around and going, hang on, autocratic states control these resources. That's not sensible. At the same time, we have this sort of net zero goal. Where do you think that that's going to end up in the shape, given what's just happened? Well, I think it's another example of the seriousness and sometimes the lack of seriousness with which we've um, addressed um, some of the big questions that we face. We, we do have to um, reduce carbon emissions. We do, um, I think, want to move to cleaner sources of energy. But we need to have an honest debate about what is realistic, how quickly we can do it, uh, what this means for the security of our supply, um, uh, what it means for the cost uh, of you know, heating people's homes or providing um, industrial you know, energy for industrial usage. Um, and we haven't had a very honest debate about that. You know, we convince ourselves that we can become a wind superpower and there are other types of energy that, uh, that we don't necessarily need anymore. When uh, you know, we face quite obvious problems with wind um, connected to its intermittency, whether that's about the reliability of the supply or about the hidden costs. Um, and and nuclear is going to need to be part of our mix. Some of the people on the green side of the debate, uh, um, they want to reduce carbon emissions, but they don't want to do it that way. Um, yeah, it's going to um, be a tough one, yeah. And, and gas is going to have to continue to play a significant part um, in uh, meeting our energy demands we and we are we have but not presumably been, our gas yeah right yes, we, yes. we 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 sit on um <clears throat> um great supplies of gas in the north sea and under the ground and we've uh we've basically shown an unwillingness to exploit that perversely while still importing gas from elsewhere well it's it's called the the sort of the, you know the exchange problem we're not doing the the uh the carbon yes. emissions but we're getting them from somewhere else. Indeed. Okay, we're going to go to some questions for you at home. Um, I've got a question from Conlon. Conlon, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. I just wanted to ask your guys' opinion on the UK's announcement that they're going to be phasing out Russian oil by the end of the year, following, uh, obviously, the Biden administration saying they're completely banning energy imports. So my question to you guys is, we're obviously already in an energy crisis in the UK. So is this move a necessary one? Did this need to follow on top of the existing sanctions and the getting rushed out of SWIFT? What's your take on this? Okay, Nick, what do you think? 
my personal view is um, is that actually this is the next place we have to go to <clears throat> anyway, collectively as the West. Um, it is undoubtedly the case that the war is going to continue. Uh, it is undoubtedly the case that more atrocities are going to be perpetrated and, and we need to be able to ramp up our response. We need to hurt the Russian economy more. Um, and even if this means a serious price uh, for Western economies in the short term, mm. uh, then we're going to have to take action on uh, Russian energy exports, uh, which, after all, uh, whether you want to seize an oligarch's yacht or whether you don't, uh, if if you know if if Europe is transferring hundreds of millions uh, um, you know, uh, to pay for Russian energy, uh, then then I'm afraid we are funding the war effort, and yeah, that's that has to stop. And I, that's a really interesting point that you know at the same time as we're sanctioning left, right, and centre, we're putting you know, exorbitantly priced, uh, or, you know, oil and gas uh, uh, money back into his pocket. So it does seem uh, a trade-off we have to do. Okay, thanks, Conlon. Um, we've got a call now from Helena. Helena, are you there? I'm here. Thank you so very much for the very interesting talk. Um, I guess my question is, like, uh, let's just assume that all the things that are more on the table in terms of further sanctions that we could adopt against Russia don't work. <laughs> what would be your view about the no-fly zone? Is that the red line that should never be crossed? Right, Helena, thank you for that, because you've read my, that was my, going to be my last question to Nick, so you've actually preempted it beautifully. I mean, you mentioned, Nick, of course, you seem to have some reservations about <laughs> it. Take us through where you think we are on a no-fly zone and where we might end up even. I'm very concerned about the idea of a no-fly zone. Um, if, if it's our view that uh, we should become participants uh, in this conflict, uh, that we should you know, start a shooting match with Russians um, uh, over the future of Ukraine. The decision um, should have been made several years ago. Uh, you know, uh, Ukraine is not part of NATO. Uh, its, uh, its status in terms of uh, Western willingness to fight for it uh, was never uh, determined. And this is what I mean about if we're going to enter into this sort of longer term standoff with Russia, uh, then we're going to need greater clarity uh, so that he understands what he can't do and what right. the consequences mm. will be uh, if he does. Uh, but I think it's quite difficult to sort of change the rules uh, as we go. And the imposition of a no-fly zone means that we will be sending our planes up in the air to shoot down Russian planes, potentially put boots on the ground to stop Russians from shooting from the ground uh, up at our planes. Um, as soon as we shoot down a Russian plane, and, and let's be honest, Putin, you know, Putin has made clear that he would consider any forces uh, imposing a no-fly zone uh, as participants in the conflict, uh, and we would be participants in the conflict, uh, and it, it carries with it a severe risk of escalation, and this is an escalation with with a nuclear power um, and with uh, and with a pretty dangerous leader. So I'm, I personally um, cannot see the circumstances in which I would support uh, a no-fly zone. Um, and I think, I, think, I think the point is that while we cannot, we cannot become participants in this war, uh, what we must do is to do everything we possibly can to help the Ukrainians to fight the war. Uh, and I think, that, you know, I think that's, we've done a reasonably good job of that so far, but we've got to carry on doing that and go as far as we can. Wise words. Um, I'm going to half disagree with you on the no-fly zone, because I think we can't impose it on the whole of Ukraine, but there's a paper out from us tomorrow as to why you could do it in the west of Ukraine, where, of course, there aren't, there is no Russian uh, you know, force or even a danger at the moment of, of shooting down anyone. But have to wait for tomorrow for that. Nick, thank you for your thoughts and for sharing your ideas with us today. Thank you thank also you. for joining us uh, at home. We'll be back uh, next week for another edition of The Scoop and hope to see you joining us then. Have a good evening.